Hi, I'm Paul Feinberg, host of UCLA Anderson's podcast. I'm here today with Professor Raman Narayanan, uh, whom everyone at Anderson calls Subu. Uh, our topic today, healthcare in the United States, the past, the present, and where it might be headed in the future. Subu, our topic today, of course, is, is healthcare. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to begin is maybe for you to describe what a good ultimate solution for uh, a healthcare system for this country would be and then we'll talk about some of the challenges of, of actually getting there. Sure. So if you uh, think about any healthcare system, not only in the U.S. but in the world in general, so any healthcare, any good healthcare system aspires to three main goals. So these are you know, quality, access, and efficiency. So essentially, you know, providing quality care to as many people as possible uh, while keeping costs under control. And if you think about the uh, history of uh, the evolution of healthcare in the U.S., then um, for much of the 20th century, uh, quality and efficiency took a backseat to access. So it was all about access. And in the 1960s, uh, you know, Congress enacted these two major uh, health insurance programs, Medicare and Medicaid, which expanded access to, say, tens of millions of Americans. Then by starting with the 70s and about the 80s, the focus shifted more to cost containment with uh, the rise in managed care. Um, and about the 90s or so, um, there was a general consensus that most of the cost problems had been licked, that um, even though there was some sort of a backlash against managed care at that point. So pretty much at any point in time, these have been sort of the three main goals of uh, uh, the healthcare system. Um, and if you think about the current state of the US healthcare system, then it still faces challenges on these three fronts. So for example, uh, on access, you know, uh, think about 47 million people are uninsured currently, which is about, I think, 15% of the population, which is a fairly significant number. Uh, in terms of costs, healthcare costs represent um, more than 15% of the GDP. I think in terms of the 2008 figures, it's almost 18%. And uh, so not only is this figure high, it's also been growing over time. So for the last 25 years, this share of GDP has nearly doubled. So it used to be about 10% of GDP, uh, whereas now it's almost 18%. Um, and also in terms of quality, even though um, you know, the US is probably on the frontier in terms of innovation, coming up with new technologies, new procedures, new drugs, there is a lot of discrepancy in care. Um, uh, based on the region that you live in and also based on you know, how much you earn, stuff like that. So there, there is um, a lot of uh, variation in the quality of care that's available too. So these three goals still present, um, so these three are still major challenges that are being faced uh, by the US healthcare system. But uh, ultimately, if you think about uh, what is it that a good solution will have, what characteristics it will have, uh, it'll, uh, the aim is to provide quality healthcare to uh, you know, as many people as possible uh, at uh, the most efficient costs, under the most efficient costs. Okay, so you, know, you can't read the newspaper or follow a, uh, an election without people discussing healthcare. So, right. mm -hmm. so the goals you described are um, lofty, the, you know, the end all goals. Right. Um, these are not the uh, practical goals that mm -hmm. people talk about. I, we hear all sorts of phrases about universal health care, socialized right. medicine, right. freedom of choice. I mean, these are all the, the, the catchphrases. And, and mm -hmm. I don't want to um, go too far into the politics because we're not the, the Department of Political Science. Right. It's impossible to have this conversation without talking about it a little bit. Right. Where do you think we're headed? You know, what, what are some of the the challenges to getting to those goals. I mean, what, what can happen in, in a country like the United States uh, as they move forward? Sure. So, um, so one of the goals, like I mentioned, is access, right? And so um, a lot of thought has been put into how we can make sure that every American has access to health insurance, because a lot of people feel it should be a right um, and not a privilege to have health insurance, especially in a developed world, uh, nation like ours. So the goal is to make sure that everyone has access to health insurance. And one way of doing so is you know, by either having some uh, uh, mandates, which you know, would require everybody to purchase health insurance and you know, penalize them if they don't, um, or you know, have a single payer system, uh, which is backed by the government, which is uh, a solution that other countries like the UK or Canada have followed. Um, now, these are all different solutions that you can think of, but of course there is uh, a lot of uh, political will against some of these solutions. So fundamentally, Americans like choice. So any solution that would 
uh, impinge on their ability to choose uh, across different providers or across different plans would ultimately meet with some strong form of resistance. So um, the current thinking is to modify this whole idea of uh, a single payer system and present a publicly financed uh, health insurance plan as an alternative to existing private health insurance. So the idea is you could have a publicly financed health insurance plan and have it compete with the other private health insurance plans in the market. And by doing so, uh, what the goal is, uh, the idea is that the, private, the publicly financed health insurance plan would have lower costs because you know, they would be uh, able to attract more enrollees, they would be able to negotiate down uh, prices much better like Medicare does. Um, and because they have lower costs, they may also price lower. And uh, in turn, they may force the private insurance companies to lower their premiums. So that's sort of the goal behind some of the recent policy proposals. Now, of course, for this to work, what uh, needs to happen, what needs to be hold true is that the public insurance plans do need to have these low costs. And the evidence on that front is a little sketchy. So because a lot of states currently have these publicly financed health insurance plans as an option. And uh, recent studies have found that uh, these plans don't necessarily have lower costs than private health insurance plans. And if they don't have lower costs, then it's not clear what benefit they may be bringing. Um, there is some evidence to show that private health insurance plans do exercise some amount of market power uh, because uh, um, you know, uh, if, especially in markets where there are very few health insurance plans, they may be able to drive up prices. So a recent study that my colleagues and I conducted, uh, and we find that uh, in areas where health, insur health um, insurance plans are consolidating, where they are merging, uh, it leads to increases in price for the next couple of years. So there is some evidence to show that private uh, health insurance plans can exercise market power. And if uh, there is an option of a public plan which can hold down costs, then that may be able to mitigate this market power to some extent. But of course, for the whole thing to hold true, you would need uh, this public option to have lower costs. What about the idea of the, the, the profits that are in the, the, the health care system? Mm -hmm. I mean, in this country, at least in, in my lifetime, doctors some doctors, anyway, become doctors partly because you can earn a, a very nice living and Absolutely. pharmacists mm -hmm. and people who um, create new drugs, I mean, uh, big uh, pharmaceutical companies. Right. But that's not the, historically, doctors didn't always become doctors for right. profits. And um, even in other countries, mm -hmm. culturally, not everyone seeks medicine as a profession because right. it's the, the, the route to um, a, a beach house uh, and, and, and those sorts of things. And, right. and I'm not creating a value judgment about that, uh -huh. but I'm wondering how much of the, the culture of medicine for profit in the United States uh -huh. matters in, in the overall economic discussion of, the, of health care going oh, forward. Uh, oh, absolutely. So uh, one thing we discussed earlier was how costs are much higher in the U.S. And one key reason for that is uh, the way uh, incentives are structured for health care providers. So if you think about both doctors as well as hospitals, then they are usually reimbursed uh, per procedure. Right? So they have every incentive to provide a greater volume of services and not just focus on the quality of services that they offer. And uh, time and again, a lot of studies have found some evidence of demand inducement. So if you have an elective procedure uh, which uh, you know, reimburses the physician or the hospital at a higher amount, then uh, there is a greater incidence of such procedure that has been found. So um, because of the way this whole incentive uh, structure uh, uh, has been, uh, sorry, um, so let me rephrase the last point. So because of the way um, the incentive system has been structured, there is uh, you know, definitely an element that affects the, co um, the cost side of the equation because uh, there is, um, uh, you know, every player in the healthcare system has some incentive to prescribe more and more procedures and not think about uh, how cost effective this may be. Um, so that definitely does play a role. What about um, the difference between having people insured or have access to basic medical care mm -hmm. versus access to the most um, recently uh, conceived surgeries or treatments? And, and what's the economic cost mm -hmm. to the country as a whole that so many people can't get treatment for 
what start off as minor maladies and mm -hmm. then they end up in the emergency room with much more serious uh, illnesses. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so one other aspect that's really driving up the costs is you know, related to this other goal of access that we discussed. So in order to keep costs under control, um, uh, any good solution should also you know, aim at increasing access. Because you know, like you rightly pointed out, if there are you know, uh, say 40 million people who don't have health insurance, then at some point in time, if they suffer some sort of uh, um, you know, injury or some sort of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, medical emergency, then they end up using services in the you know, emergency room, which they don't ultimately end up paying for. Um, but so essentially what is happening is that people who do purchase health insurance end up subsidizing uh, the uninsured. And this drives up costs for the entire system as a whole. So any good solution should think not about you know, costs and access uh, separately, but should think about addressing these uh, together. Right? Uh, and uh, to that extent, you know, um, some of these options, like say the private, uh, the public health insurance option that uh, is being put forward now, uh, aims to do that uh, because um, the idea is by you know having lower premiums, you could attract uh, a lot of these um, people who are uninsured um, and who may not otherwise have the ability to purchase health insurance. And by providing them greater access, you are holding down costs as well. So that is one side. Uh, another side is also when you think about uh, how insurance is offered uh, in the U.S. A majority of Americans, about I think 60 percent. Uh, get their health insurance from their employers. And um, employers, especially small firms, are at a major disadvantage because, uh, because of the rising costs of health insurance. Um, and as a result, you know, they're not able to remain as competitive because they're not able to attract the best talent. Because the best talent may prefer to work at larger firms where they may be able to get a lot of these health insurance benefits. So uh, when we address you know, issues like access, uh, it not only um, uh, addresses problems in the healthcare system, but also has uh, an impact on the larger economy as a whole because uh, it could lead to um, you know lower unemployment uh, because you know smaller firms are now able to hire more. It could lead to lower inflation because uh, healthcare costs you know represent a large part of the GDP. So if uh, you could control healthcare costs, that could also lead to lower inflation. Uh, it could also lead to greater productivity because people are healthier, they are happier, they work much better. Um, so overall, it could have uh, a very strong effect on uh, the health of the overall economy. I mentioned before we hear the term socialized medicine, and I'm not sure everybody even understands uh, what that means. I know there are mm -hmm. countries uh, that have pure, free health care for all citizens, and right. maybe that's what people are referring to. Uh -huh. Are there any um, nations out there who have a health care system that either entirely or in part the United States could use as a role model, perhaps other than a country that has purely just socialized medicine? Sure. So, um, uh, so Canada is one good example because uh, there are often uh, comparisons made between the U.S. and Canada. Um, now, people often think about you know the Canadians as a, uh, having a socialized healthcare system. What they do is they have a healthcare system that's financed by the government, but um, the actual delivery of healthcare is still uh, made by doctors who are in the private sector. So uh, um, the the uh, socialized or the public aspect comes about from the fact that the government pays for the healthcare for everyone. And uh, it's interesting to think about Canada as a comparison or as a role model even. Um, so uh, a lot has been made about how costs are much lower, and that is true. So I think in Canada, costs are about 10% of, G uh, healthcare costs are about 10% of GDP compared to about you know, 17 to 18% for the US. So uh, costs are relatively lower for sure. Um, and if you look at outcomes, then uh, there is some debate over whether um, you know, people in Canada do have better health outcomes than people in the U.S. So if you look at measures like um, you know, infant mortality or you know, life expectancy, then if you look at just the raw numbers, then uh, Canadians perform better. But once you condition for something like, say, birth weight, um, then what we see is that the U.S. actually achieves parity with uh, um, you know, people from Canada. Um, so what this essentially implies is that it's still not very clear as to um, how, how much better the Canadian system may be in terms of uh, the outcome side, at least. Uh, definitely on the cost side, I think uh, they have managed to keep their costs at a much lower level. 
Um, of course, there are, if you think about uh, having a publicly financed health insurance system, then uh, there are certain uh, drawbacks to it as well. So it may have to be financed by higher taxes, for example. Uh, it could lead to lower choice for consumers, which is something most Americans would not be very happy about. Um, it could lead to longer wait times for services, especially for you know, elective services. Uh, so there is some evidence on that front that uh, if you are in Canada, if you want to access um, you know, elective procedures like a surgery, then you may have uh, you know, longer wait times uh, than you may have in you know, some state in the US, for example. So there are some positive aspects to you know, the healthcare system uh, in Canada, but there are some drawbacks as well. Um, I think ultimately we would have to come up with a solution that is tailored well to our needs. Uh, what are the biggest hurdles uh, facing, you know, facing the current administration as they um, make an attempt to uh, redesign the healthcare system? Sure. So um, I think the biggest hurdle is in terms of you know, how many active stakeholders there are in this uh, whole system. So you know, one big hurdle, of course, is you know, if you're trying to push through uh, an idea, even something like a a public health insurance option. Right? So the idea is to just provide an extra option to the consumer that um, is publicly financed. Now, um, there is a significant uh, you know, political faction that will oppose anything like that because they see it as you know, the first step towards socialized medicine, where the public health insurance option would uh, you know, perhaps uh, overtake all the pr or, or would uh, perhaps expand and be the only option remaining in a few years. So, um, so because they see that as a, pot a potential danger, there is, uh, you know, a fairly strong opposition coming from people on the right, uh, on the right side of the political spectrum, um, against you know this public health insurance option. Apart from that, you know, there are also a whole bunch of really important stakeholders like you know the insurance companies. There are. Uh, physician organizations, there are consumer advocacy groups, all of which have incentives which don't necessarily align with each other when you're thinking about healthcare reform. So, so one idea that's often come up is if you think about cost containment, um, then you know, a physician should have access to electronic medical records. Now, if you have electronic medical records, that um, dramatically increases the efficiency of care because um, it leads to better information flows across different organizations. So if I'm treated at one hospital and I'm referred to a different hospital, then physicians at both hospitals have access to my records electronically, so there is you know, less loss of information, so on and so forth. So, this, so that leads to better care. It also leads to lower costs because it leads to greater standardization and you know, lower administrative costs. So that has been proposed as a solution for the last, I think, 15 years or so. But it's been really hard to implement. And one large reason for that is because um, physicians have a lot to lose in terms of, um, so physicians may, have, may stand to lose a lot by in, uh, in the short term by implementing these electronic medical records. Uh, that is because these uh, electronic medical records would you know, eliminate a lot of redundant procedures. And since physicians and hospitals get paid on the basis of uh, the number of procedures they perform, it could lead to, you know, it could impact their bottom line in the short term. So um, it is because of, you know, partly because of these concerns that, uh, you know, previous administrations have found it really hard to implement something uh, like uh, these electronic medical records, which, uh, you know, from all standpoints would stand to benefit the society as a whole. Uh, so the physicians, uh, you know, so they are, sort of one major stakeholder in this. There's also you know, consumer advocacy groups. Uh, advocacy groups. So they have um, you know, privacy concerns, confidentiality concerns about uh, the same, um, uh, you know, about implementing these electronic medical records. So you know, they represent another stakeholder group which are against this implementation. So essentially, um, uh, I think what is gonna be the most difficult to uh, push through is, uh, I think the major hurdle is gonna come about from the fact that uh, you have these different powerful stakeholders in the system who may have uh, incentives which are not always aligned with each other. Okay, um, mm -hmm. you're sitting in your office and your yeah. phone rings and you hear, um, Subu, Barack Obama, uh -huh. uh, I only have two minutes. Uh -huh. um, what do you think the healthcare system should look like in the United States that's um, uh, as close to workable for, 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 for everybody involved? Right, so... Um, so I would say, uh, at the very least, it should 
try and expand access as much as possible because you know I subscribe to the view also that uh, healthcare should be something that is uh, affordable and should be something that should be a right for all citizens. So um, I think uh, any good solution should take that into account. Um, and um, you know, uh, doing so in a cost-effective manner uh, would certainly make a lot of sense. So trying to push through something like uh, uh, a, you know, a health insurance, a publicly financed health insurance option is fine, I think, from, in my opinion. Uh, as long as you know, it is made sure that, say, it is not, say, subsidized by government funds, because that would mean you know, it is not competing with the private insurers on a, on a fair level. So having a public in, publicly financed health, insur health insurance option uh, um, and competing, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Having a publicly financed health insurance plan uh, that is not really directly subsidized by the government so that it competes on an equal footing, making sure that you know, uh, it puts in place measures that drive down costs um, so that it can uh, uh, keep um, or it can Rain, uh, rain in cost increases on the private side as well. Uh, I think that's certainly uh, a good way to think about uh, in terms of uh, implementing any viable solution.